Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I want to welcome everybody here today. Um, and on behalf of myself and Nathan Snaza, who helped to facilitate this um, event with me, um, we want to thank the PEAT program uh, at UR for generous funding for the event, as well as uh, our WGSS program for co-sponsoring and um, providing us with food and drinks. Um, in particular, Marilee Nipsud and Nancy Proxt, as well as the Department of English for co-sponsoring the event, um, and Louis Schwartz, our fearless leader, and Emily Tarchikov. So uh, I'm Julia Singh. For those of you who don't know me, I'm an assistant professor of English and a board member of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies here. And um, I'm very happy to see a lot of familiar and unfamiliar faces <coughs> here. I've been mulling over how to take up the impossible task of introducing Jack Halberstam. Impossible because there is no approach that seems to me sufficient. My first impulse, and the one that would probably be best, would be to simply say, behold, Jack Halberstam, and to step aside <laughs> as quickly as possible. But some of you don't yet know Jack's work, and that would, um, a more robust introduction, I think, would be necessary. I thought, of course, of a more conventional form, something like this. I am honored this afternoon to introduce Jack Halberstam, currently professor of English and core faculty in gender studies at Columbia University, and author of many of my favorite books, including Female Masculinity, The Queer Art of Failure, Skin Shows, In a Queer Time and Place, and Gaga Feminism, in no particular order. Professor Halberstam is also the co-editor with Lisa Lowe of the spectacular book series Perverse Modernities. He's also the preeminent online queer culture, culture pulpit um, blogger of bully bloggers and the world's most charming champion of failure and its utopian potentialities. But this wonderful laundry list also seems critically insufficient incapable of capturing the dynamism of what Halberstam's work has offered those of us reading, writing, teaching, and living at the intersections of queer and feminist theory and politics. So let me try this with Exhibit A. Several years ago, as I was mobilizing toward new courses and writings on queer theory, I found myself at a cafe pouring through the pages of female masculinity. I was immersed in Jack's thinking through figures close to my heart, the tomboy, the butch, when a stranger tapped me on the shoulder to inquire about my reading. We talked, we exchanged ideas and contact information until the next tap on my shoulder. Carrying female masculinity with me during the world at this time, I made a host of new and unanticipated friendships, both effeminate gay and butch intellectuals, genderqueer college students, curious baristas, and coffee bums alike all magnetized toward this text. So much so that there's a running joke now in Richmond that female masculinity is, in fact, the ultimate queer bait. <laughs> but it's not simply that the book is a useful tool for picking up companions, though it is that too. It's the text's insistence on figures buried by history, ignored by pop culture, are sites around and through which we can begin to rethink the world. Halberstam's work draws people together. It gathers strangers and makes them intimates. It forges strange collectivities in unexpected places, places that once seemed exclusive, uniform, individualized, inaccessible. Or here's another way in, and I'll present you with exhibit B. <laughs> I can't stop remembering the moment that the queer art of failure entered my life. It was a moment when so much seemed to be failing personally and intellectually, and I was unmoored. The failure to live through a normative life, the failure to write a properly disciplined book, the failure to know enough, the failure of my body not to exert pain, the failure to control my emotional life. In the midst of all this failure, my most beloved friend and co-conspirator, Nathan, pulled from his shelf a copy of The Queer Art of Failure and said simply, I think you should read this. And I did. And in many ways, I still and always am reading this book. 
because it confirmed my dis-ease within the world and my desire for another world that is also this one. And it reminded me of something I knew, but knew only faintly and without voice, that my failures would become the parts of my thinking and living that would sustain me and would re-suture the seams between myself and the world. All this I gleaned through Jack's readings of animated Pixar films. No mean feat, Jack Halberstam. I offer then a subtitle to this book and to Jack's work more broadly, an invitation to transform how we inhabit ourselves and each other, to rethink how we've become and are becoming embodied together, to unstitch and re-sew the materials that keep making us. A little long for a subtitle, I know. But Jack's work on the whole does no less than this. It compels us toward our own radical transformations, toward new and as of yet unexplored or lost or unimagined modes of habitation, of cohabitation. It advocates for the failed and the marginal. It brings into critical consciousness figures we've culturally dismissed, the freaks, monsters, queers, retrogrades, losers. And not only does it embrace them, but it compels us to embrace those parts of ourselves that are flawed, freakish, and fail. Jack offers him, us to cite him directly at last, ways of being together in brokenness. I am thrilled to be broken this afternoon with all of you, students and friends and strangers and colleagues. After so much collective struggle this past week at the University of Richmond, and as we begin now to imagine new ways of being and living and learning and unbecoming together, Jack's presence and the disruptions that he promises to offer us could not feel more timely. Please join me as wildly as you wish in welcoming Jack Halberstam. is now you have to live up to it, right? <laughs> that was beautiful. Um, there's no compliment greater than being understood in the weirdness of your work and in the, uh, some of the unintended uh, consequences that you hope will go out and proliferate. So um, with that, let me just say how um, delighted I am to be here today. Uh, I'm, I've been really looking forward to this. Uh, and I'm excited to present this new uh, work to you on the category of wildness. And I'm going to try to think with you about this category by exploring the figure of the zombie, which I don't know if you've noticed, but the zombie is everywhere, right? I mean, uh, never mind Walking Dead. Uh, there's almost no day goes by that in the newspaper there isn't a reference to a zombie this or that, a zombie politics, zombie economics, uh, zombie capitalism, right? Uh, look no further than Donald Trump for, you know, living proof of uh, zombie politicians. Uh, there are people who are literally the walking dead who nonetheless represent these new forms of life. So, uh, in this... Uh, talk, I want to think with you about the sudden ubiquity of this term, why we are suddenly confronted with the zombie at this moment in, in the twi early 20th century, and what it tells us uh, about the world that we live in. So uh, with that, let me um, introduce some of my terms so that we can uh, use them to situate uh, some of the zombie texts that I have for you, and I'm going to ramble through all kinds of different forms of uh, zombies, some of which you'll really recognize and love, like The Walking Dead, some of which are uh, little-known British TV shows that you, you may or may not have heard of, and some of which are forms of life that you yourself are in intimate relationship to. And so I have a whole section, for example, on pets as zombies. Um, and I have to give a trigger warning that when I do talk about pets, I am not talking about your animal, it's not about your cat, your dog, your budgie, but maybe it is. 
So the category of um, wildness is um, a really it's a really difficult term to think of, to think with. So it in, it in no way simply signals the untamed frontier or the absence of modernity, the barbaric or the animalistic, or the opposite of civilization. Rather, and this is the version of wildness that I want to share with you and explore with you, we have to think about wildness in what we might call post-colonial or decolonizing vein. That is the moment in which we find ourselves. It's returned in queer theory in recent years as a desire to return queerness to a disorderly field of desires and drives, not the tidy field of identities, <laughs> gay, lesbian, transgender, bisexual, that we find ourselves in, in now. Wildness is a category that seeks to return us to a disorienting and disquieting place in which we can't exactly find ourselves in the categories uh, available. The other thing that wildness does, and I, I say this in relationship to the project of pedagogy, is it confronts you with things that you don't know and things that are unexpected and surprising. So it offers up a form of pedagogy, pedagogy in, the, in terms of not being able to learn without being surprised. So every classroom has to have an element of the wild in it or else you will not learn. If the teacher simply comes in and presents you with a tame and domestic version of life, as you already know it, you will undoubtedly leave that classroom none the wiser. So when you walk into the classroom, you have to hope that the professor creates for you a wild space within which you don't know what's going to happen next, you don't know what you're going to read next, and you might find yourself confronted with imagery that challenges or disturbs you. So in a moment when we are debating things like uh, trigger warnings, let's use the wild as well as an element of you know, untamed learning, if you like. And I'll try to give examples of how that works. And I do it often through popular culture in my books, um, in The Queer Art of Failure. I try to sort of disarm people who might be resistant to the idea of failure or the, you know, the end of mastery by using animated films that we all know and love to demonstrate that at the heart of those films are projects built around necessary uh, failure. So pop culture is a place where you are delighted and entertained to the extent that you are surprised and encouraged to be curious. You are generally bored and made to feel uninterested when people simply present the same material over and over again in the same way. So um, wildness, I hope, will have a kind of pedagogical project uh, here today. So let me give you three examples of the way in which I use wildness, and then we can <coughs> do Q&A. Feel free to either add to my lexicon of wildness, and think of this really as an attempt to develop a new critical vocabulary for thinking about difference, thinking about knowledge projects, thinking about knowing, doing, being, thinking about a world that literally changes overnight. We are so bombarded by information in the world that we live on, so preoccupied with social media, um, so updated in a continuous fashion uh, that in, in fact we do require a new critical vocabulary to try to make sense of the world that we live in and the legislation of power, difference, and uh, punishment uh, within it. If you think about it, chaos is much closer to the quality of everyday life than order. Okay? But the big sort of fascist and totalitarian projects of the 20th century, as James C. Scott, the uh, anthropologist, uh, tells us, um, convinced us that order was the natural scheme of things. And so we look for city streets that are orderly. We want outside our nature to be in straight lines. We enjoy the garden, right? All of these projects are really, in many ways, colonial projects that is not simply selling us a way of life that is proper to Americans or Europeans, but also has embedded within it an aesthetic, an aesthetic of order. But if you just think about your own life, think about your own day, look at your own desk, okay? look in your own closet, think about 
the psychology of hoarding that has become such a problem in this contemporary moment, you will see that we actually live in an increasingly chaotic world, and these political bureaucratic measures are just attempts to convince us otherwise. So what if we made peace with chaos rather than always trying to tame it? What if we decided to think with the unscripted and the disorderly rather than always trying to keep it at bay? That's one of the questions that I'm asking in relationship to this category of wildness. And I'll just give you an obvious example. Every day you, you, you may watch the news or read the newspaper to see what the weather is going to be. And every day, the weather fails to live up to its billing, right? There's a big storm every day in New York City, where I now live. I get a weather alert on my phone, post-Sandy, right? Post-Hurricane Sandy, weather alert. Huge thunderstorm coming your way, batten the hatches, tie everything down, put the animals inside, right? And every day, that storm fails to materialize. So we live in a world where we're surrounded by what Tim Morton calls a, a series of hyper-objects. And hyper-objects are things like the weather that we are in relationship to as if it was an object of data, but that remains unknowable and unpredictable to us. So we can give a vague sense of what might happen together to, tomorrow in terms of the weather, but the weather will never be governed by us. Okay? And it's true that we have created climate change, but at the level of the micro, you cannot change the weather tomorrow. So it literally escapes human control and then offers you an example of the many different kinds of phenomena that we live in constant relationship to that exceed our control and should exceed our control and therefore should remind us that we live in a state of chaos, unknowability and unpredictability despite the fact that our various instruments of measurement try to tell us otherwise. Okay, so that would be one thing. And there's a great book um, by a sociologist called John Moore uh, called After Method, Mess in Social Science Research from about a decade ago, in which he makes a critique of conventional sociology because sociology often is interested in really, really cool things. But by seeking to know those things, those behaviors, those communities, those subcultures, it tends to drain what's interesting out of the object being studied, right? And students in the room will attest to that, I'm sure. Uh, as soon as you have to read about something, it's sort of not that interesting uh, anymore. But he suggests that there are entire categories of human experience that need to be represented as chaotic and not known through a script that says, this is what we can say about the weather, one, two, three, right? So he includes in this category of human experience the ephemeral, the indefinite, and the irregular. The ephemeral, which has very much been a topic of queer studies, much of queer culture, um, as the late Jose Munoz wrote, was ephemeral. It's something that took place in a bar and was, was never repeated. Uh, the indefinite, the unknowable, um, the unlocatable, and the irregular, right? These are categories of human experience that you pass through every single day, but that a social scientist is trained to make sense of. Now, once you make sense of them, they don't exist anymore in their irregularity. So we could ask the question whether academics are part of the problem in terms of tidying up the world that we live in, when we should be part of returning the world that we live in to its messy, interesting complexity. All right? And I think a lot, of, um, a lot of different very counterintuitive projects, like Julieta Singh's new book on thinking, of, uh, thinking without mastery, propose exactly that. But they fly in the face of disciplinary knowledge and therefore tend not to be accepted within the disciplines from which they uh, emerge. So that's my first category, is to just have you start thinking for yourself about the fact that you live in a chaotic world, you are a chaotic person, the reality of who you are is constantly being tidied up, and that we might want to think about ways to be better narrators of our own messiness. Okay? And then the second category, I have reckless up here, and this would go against the current uh, discourse of safe space that is used a lot for particularly LGBT communities uh, on campus. And 
Here I'm sort of, again, I'm arguing for the surprising. I'm arguing for taking risks. I'm arguing that in a, in a, in a world committed to order, governance, and bureaucracy, we, to quote an Atticus slogan, have to seek to be ungovernable. And the only way to do that is to engage in practices that are irresponsible, uh, reckless, that take risks, that don't constantly turn to the state and ask for protection. Okay? So to ask for protection from the state is also to consent to being the kind of subject that the state protects. Right? Now the Black Lives Matter um, movement has taught us very well that the state protects unevenly, that it protects white middle class people, people with money, much more than it protects uh, poor people and people of color and particularly black bodies. So when we have LGBT communities asking the state for protection, there's an alliance that is being made with those subjects whom the state has agreed to protect. And there is the failure to jump on a coalition with the subjects whom the state has decided to sacrifice uh, in terms of this larger goal of security. Okay? So recklessness over security would be another way of thinking about wildness. Then finally, um, if you think about you know, the current era of environmental collapse that we live in, we're, we really see some of the effects of climate change in terms of the intensity of the weather. And I, I want to claim uh, that wildness operates within the, the mood of the emphatic, and this would be linked then to both the chaotic and the reckless. So rather than scholarship being something that stands up and you know, you survey the archive and you make careful recommendations on the basis of lots of research. What if we go instead for intensity? Not necessarily, not necessarily for violence, but we might want to think about the place of violence in all of this. But we start thinking in terms of projects that have intense investments in them, rather than the disinterested, objective projects of the early 20th century. So you probably, many of you, have not been in a class where you haven't heard the critique of objectivity and a reminder that when we produce knowledge, we don't do so in disinterested ways. We do it in emphatic and passionate ways. Now, passion is not always a good thing and can as easily be used for fascist purposes as anything else, but I would say that scholarship without investment in this day and age is something that we should move away from, and we should think about how to introduce, therefore, the mood of the emphatic into the work that we do. And that's partly what I'm trying to, um, again, convey in terms of this uh, category of the wild. Okay? So that's, that's my framework. I'm writing a book on wildness. It has numerous parts to it. It includes what I hope will be a useful, new, critical vocabulary that builds upon notions of disorder, anarchy, chaos, uh, unruliness, ungovernability, and seeks to rethink and re-examine the concept of the human and of embodiment in relationship to these aspects of human, the human condition and human behavior that we have tried to keep at bay with our so-called civilizing, orderly, bureaucratic projects of knowing. Okay? So you can see that there's a role here for the academic to unlink knowing from the organized and the orderly. And that's why I often do go through, therefore, the ridiculous, uh, the slightly silly, uh, and the pop cultural. And that's exactly what you're about to see. All right? So you're with me so far? We've got, and, and you know, I'm, I'm open to, in the Q&A, please, you know, give me, give me the critiques and the, and the concerns about this category. Uh, as I said at the beginning, I'm very well aware of the fact that wildness has been produced in a colonial context to represent the opposite of civilization. But now that we're at the, on the other side of the production of a discourse of civilization, right, we see all of the violence that has been carried out under the heading of civilization, we should be much more suspicious of the term civilization than we should be of the categories that it produced as its negative. Right? So the category of wildness, therefore, re-emerges as civilization is exhausted of its meaning and becomes a site that we might want to, to look to um, for these alternative ways of thinking. So I have two sections. 
Uh, in one, in the first section, I'm going to suggest that you all live in relationship to zombie forms of life. Uh, so it's not something that some people are doing and not others. And then in the second section, I'm going to ask us to consider how we've begun to represent life and death on TV through these shows about zombie death. Okay, so one, just to get you going, get you a little riled up, uh, dead pets. So I hope that, um, how, are, are you guys familiar with Monty Python? <laughs> you know the dead pet uh, skit then. So let's, let's just warm up to the idea of dead pet pets with a humorous example from uh, Monty Python that I think offers us a sort of queer, anti-humanist take on the dead, the wild, and the extinct. So in this famous skit, for anyone who doesn't remember it, a man played by John Cleese, of course, returns to a pet store with a parrot lying face up on the bottom of the cage. And he says, I wish to complain about this parrot what I ordered not half an hour ago from this very boutique. Right? And he comes in, he's got the, there's the Norwegian blue, practically in rigor mortis. <laughs> so the store owner says, in Monty Python style of absurdity, says, well, what's wrong with it? <laughs> it's dead. That's what's wrong with it, says an indignant John Cleese. Mm, nah, says the shop owner, Michael Palin. It's just resting, <laughs> stunned. And then he continues later on, pining for the fjords, perhaps, right? This Norwegian blue. <laughs> Cleese persists. Pine for the fjords? No, this parrot is no more. It has ceased to be. It has expired and gone to make its maker. This is a late parrot, an ex-parrot. Bereft of life, he rests in peace. All right. So this, you know, this is a skip from some 20, 30 years ago, right? But it has been recently immortalized, <laughs> just to see how invested the English uh, remain in uh, this Monty Python way of life, the meaning of life, um, by this Norwegian blue sculpture by Ian Prendergast that gives you this parrot lying flat on its back in Potter's Fields, announcing its own extinction and its enduring significance as a dead parrot or even, we might say, a dead pet. So I want to offer the dead pet or the dead parrot as a symbol of the moment that we live in. I'd say it was a time in which we are all already late, okay? like the parrot. We are late humans. We are ex-humans. We are already deceased. We masquerade as resting, stunned, or momentarily incapacitated. We suspect that we may already be living dead, hence our preoccupation with the zombie. We are not sure we're actually alive. It uh, might be one argument that I'm making, that we are, we are so unsure of what life means and what should be our preoccupation while alive that we have lapsed, if you like, into this condition of living death. Um, that said, you know, we try to convince ourselves of our liveliness by surrounding ourselves by other kinds of creatures that are partially alive and partially dead. One of those kinds of creatures would be the pet. All right, I know you don't probably agree with this, but I would say that all pets are dead pets. So think, how many people here have pets? Okay, a lot of you. You all have dead animals. No, let's call them living dead, because that will make you feel better. Um, <laughs> they are stuffed, ex-animals, prosthetic extensions of the humans uh, that own them. So what version of the human is extended by pet ownership? And notice how wrapped up pet ownership is nowadays. That, that should be one of the clues uh, that we are very, you know, that we're suddenly very invested in that pet-human relationship. There are pet industries, there are pet hotels, there's pet yoga, there's dentists for pets. There's, um, you can practically bring your pet back from the dead. You can have it stuffed. You, uh, you can have a robo-dog. You can choose all these prosthetic forms of life to surround yourself by precisely to keep convincing yourself that you are not the zombie. The zombie is always uh, elsewhere. So what, what version of the human has lapsed into this almost dead or living dead kind of slum. And here I, I would want to give as a context the, the renewed desire for longevity 
that nowadays goes by the name transhumanism. <coughs> transhumanism, as some of you will know, is a doctrine that says, and it, it is there's this one guy who writes all of these books uh, predicting that in the year uh, 2045, technology will be so exponentially advanced that we will have the technology to replace all of the cells of the human body completely in order to never die. Now, the we is a small we. The we is like the 1% who actually can afford um, to have all of their cells replaced. And his argument is that technology used to move just in leaps, maybe even in leaps and bounds, but now it, in, it moves exponentially. The difference from one mode of technology to the next is so radically different that we are approaching what he calls a singularity, the moment when the human body will be, within its own lifetime, replaceable, right? And we have all of this cell technology at work now. You can see, like, with people with cancer, can have almost every cell in their body taken out and replaced with good cells. Uh, mostly, they actually don't survive, but those people are often guinea pigs for exactly the exper experimentation that is going into trying to create longevity for an elite who will be able to afford it. Those are the dynamics of life and death. That, at a time when we have massive numbers of people of color in prisons um, and who are subject, according um, to the theory, you know, Ruthie Gilmore's work has suggested that the calculus of race is vulnerability to premature death. So we have one population that you're exposing to what's being called vulner, you know, vulnerability to premature death, and another population who is pumping millions and millions of dollars, not into poverty, not into food scarcity, not into affordable uh, health care and housing but into trying to ensure for themselves immortality in the form of scientific invention. Those are the politics within which we are producing entire classes of people uh, as zombies. Um, this is what we would call a zombie politics, which creates this kind of balancing act between life and death, between what Michel Foucault called a biopolitics uh, and a necropolitics, a politics within which some people uh, have maximized and enhanced chances of living precisely because other people are consigned to the reduced opportunities for health, uh, happiness, and longevity, right? And those two things are absolutely uh, connected, and one depends upon the other. In the same way that in the economy, the 1% only have all the wealth because the 99% don't have it, right? Or 10% of the population have most of the wealth, consigning everybody else um, to, uh, in, in, you know, in, different kinds of levels uh, of poverty. Now, so what is this zombie humanism? This is what, you know, remember that was the subtitle of the talk. It's arguing that we've entered into a new understanding of the human as a consequence. The human is no longer the subject of the enlightenment, right? The human isn't somebody who just wants to make the world a better place, not that that's exactly what the human wanted. Um, within Enlightenment discourse. Enlightenment discourse, after all, is the beginning of this racial calculus uh, of uh, life and death. But zombie humanism, zombie humanism is a form of investment in the category of humanness that arrogates liveliness, dynamism, vibrancy, and res resonance to the wealthy, the powerful, and the able body while consigning consigning all other forms of being to the status of inertia, inertia and stasis. And there's a really, um, uh, oh, let's not bypass that. Um, <laughs> you know, if, if, in case you were like, my pet is not just an accessory of me. My pet is not a, pr a prosthetic uh, that I use to enhance my own happiness. Okay. Well, uh, you just have to look up people who look like their pets online and find a large subculture of people who have, in fact, fashioned their creatures to look exactly like them um, and for whom that resemblance is a source of much pleasure. Now, if it's a lot of pleasure to the hamster to look like this young person, we have no way of knowing. Um, but clearly, clearly, this kind of modeling um, is a source of, you know, I don't, not just pleasure, not just goofiness and silliness, it is that, but it is also a graphic illustration of the way that the pet is supposed to extend you yourself, okay? Whether or not you dress your, your pet up as you, 
uh, your, your pet uh, does that work. Okay, so Jane Bennett is one of the authors who has really drawn our attention in a book called Vibrant Matter. She's drawn our attention to the way in which we think about life itself mostly in relationship to the health of the human body and very little in relationship to other forms of being uh, that we are surrounded by. So she says this. She says, a life thus names a restless activeness, uh, meaning life beyond the human, not just the human, or surrounded by forms of liveliness, <coughs> names a restless activeness, a destructive creative force presence, force presence, which means it doesn't have to be a consciousness, that does not coincide fully with any specific body. So life exceeds you. Life is not just something that is encased within you. It is more the fabric within which you make meaning, and you make meaning with others. What else? A life tears the fabric of the actual without ever fully coming out in a person, place, or thing. So you think of yourself as life. No, you channel a life force that is not exhausted by its containment in you, right? So it never fully comes out as life in you. A life points to matter and variation that enters assemblages and leaves them. A life is a vitality, proper not to any individual, but to pure imminence, or that protean swarm that is not actual, though it is real. A life contains only virtuals. It is made of virtualities. Okay. So in, in this kind of definition, we need to move away from this understanding of the human as a container into which life is poured and out of which life can be drained and think about life almost as an environment, an environment in which we are associated with many, many different forms of what she calls the force presence. <laughs> so she gives lots of examples in vibrant matter, like if you walk by some trash on the street that's rotting, there's a force presence in the trash, right? And if you take a, one of those cameras and you, you train it on the trash and then you speed it up over a time lapse, um, in, in time-lapse photography, you will see that many, many things are happening just in a piece of trash that escape your perception. Just because it escapes your perception doesn't mean it isn't there. And the arrogance of the human is that it imagines that life is only the, the, the narrative that we've told ourselves about the particular forces that are wrapped up in flesh and uh, that go forth um, as the human body. So that's part of what we mean by new materialism, is thinking about the materiality of life beyond the limits of the human body and trying to place ourselves uh, within that. So the human is lively um, only because it's being produced within a philosophy, enlightenment philosophy for the most part, that tidies up, remember that idea of the chaotic, tidies up the florid and multiplying modes of living with which the earth teems into bodies, containers, and sites. Now, if we move away from this container version of life, where your body is a container of what we consider to be the human or the, the lively, right? If we move away from this, we can begin to see living as a force that doesn't fully coincide with any specific body, and that furthermore draws its representational power from the presumption that everything around us and around the human that is not us is dead-like, right? So if we are lifelike, then everything around us is dead-like and therefore is subject to our whims, our fancies, and our use. And this is a, sort of the imperialism of the human that imagines that everything around it is simply there for our use and has no other kind of uh, purpose. Um, Whatever else dares to move or share in lifelike motion then gets represented as living dead, walking dead or is not dead because it was never living, okay? And you're probably at this point you're like, like what? Like what are you talking about, okay? So let me give you some examples. This is how we think about animals, that we farm for food, okay? And I say this not as a radical veganist, vegan, I, I eat lots of meat, uh, but I also recognize that the meat industry has produced the cow not as a form of life that has its own pleasures and its own purpose and its own trajectory through the world and its own life force, but merely as a thing that must stand somewhere until it is, you know, be milked and fed until it's time for it to be led uh, to its slaughter. So if I made that case to you, I'm sure that many of you will agree with that and say that's true. We do produce the cows as zombies, right? If anyone's ever driven up. Um, the, you know, the five in California, 
uh, near uh, Bakersfield, you can smell the, the cow manure at this place that gets called Cowschwitz um, because it is this just massive plantation of cows just standing, feeding, being milked, and waiting to be killed. Now, if I say to you that's a zombie form of life, you'll say, yeah, okay, it is. But if I say to you that the animals that perform intimate labor for us are also zombified forms of life, that's where we want to draw the line, okay? So what I want to argue is that we have created a hierarchy within animal ownership uh, that is familiar to us and that many people analogize to slavery, uh, within which there are, there are animal objects that are there t as industrial uh, um, resources, and there are animal <laughs> objects that we are in intimate relationship to. The argument is that whether it's an intimate relation or whether it's an industrial relation, the impact is the same. You have pr produced a zombified form of life for your pleasure, for you to feel like you're the human, and in order to still the life um, of this other creature. Okay, so, um, and there you have it, companion species. This, in, in many ways, is an argument that Donna Haraway tries to give us a workaround. So in her manifesto towards a, a companion species, you know, Haraway argues that we need to rethink the evolutionary narrative so that we center the dog and we see the human as peripheral to the evolutionary trajectory of the dog. And she says, <coughs> she makes a joke, who after all follows whom around picking up shit, right? <laughs> so she says, the dog has trained the human to be its companion species because we serve a purpose for it. What do we do? We pick up its shit, we provide it with food, we give it a little work to do, and then we bring it in from the cold, right? But that, I, I am in no way convinced by that because after all, who tells who when to shit in the first place, right? So there are millions of people who are like, well, I've got to get home, i got my dog. Oh, wait, so you have a dog, so, well, he needs to poop. So the dog has to wait to poop till you get home. And now you're gonna pick up its, you better pick up its shit, right? <laughs> That's the least you can do. You've left it in its house, you know? And I see this really in New York City where people have tiny apartments and massive dogs. I don't get it. And then they bring them out, they do a massive poop, usually they leave it, I take the dog back in. That's it. So this idea of a companion species is solely tested by the practical realities of what actually happens when people share their homes with animals. Um, and snuggle up next to them in bed and pet them and fondle them and then draw the line between bestiality and what? Affection for pets, right? So this is another um, part of the zombie economy in which the pet sits. So let me, let me see if I can be clear about this. In the zombie economy, the pet occupies a high place in the hierarchy of liveliness. Okay? It, it, it is higher up than the cow, but it's still in a zombie economy in which the human relegates everything around it to a status of only nearly of not alive, not really alive. It's not living dead like the cattle we slaughter or the chickens that we raise. The pet is warm, real, and alive. But its liveliness depends absolutely upon it being tethered to us, its species companion, right? So are we companions or are we, in fact, um, you know, prisoners uh, of a carceral complex within which the dog uh, and the cats uh, live. Its survival depends upon, after all, its ability to please us. If it, if it nips, okay. If it bites, no. Take it back, right? Take it back to the vet where it's, you know, or to the SPCA where it's probably going to be slaughtered. Um, if, it, if it barks, dogs bark, people. They bark. Oh, it's too much barking. I'd take it back. Right? It, it barked too much. But that's what a dog does. It barks. Uh, you know, oh, my dog doesn't bark. Oh, good. What did you do? Did you trim its toenails and take its voice box out? What did you do? So your dog doesn't bark, right? It's the survival depends upon it pleasing us by tailoring its behaviors to behaviors that we are willing to tolerate and that we can mandate. A pet can nip and chew. It must not bite and scratch. It can whimper or purr. It should not bark or whine. A pet has to learn obedience. It has to eat and shit when we say, and it has to adapt to a carceral reality in exchange for what? Not being eaten. So this practice, then, of harnessing other forms of life to the human, I would say, has been promoted and celebrated 
by theorists like Donna Haraway as an example of this decentering project in which the story of evolution and even the narrative of life itself knocks the human out of its orbit and places us in these empathic, unselfish, salvational relationship to other animals. And inevitably somebody will say, my, my animal was a rescue animal. Well, it's not a rescue animal because it would never have been endangered had we not created the conditions under which it requires rescue. So one of the tenets of zombie humanism must be, or the critique of zombie humanism, you cannot rescue what you yourself endanger. Okay? So if you create the conditions under which animals are at risk, you cannot now save it any more than in 1865, people who created a system of economy based upon the ownership of, of humans can grant liberation. There is no possibility of liberation from people who have trafficked in human slavery. And yet, that is the understanding of uh, liberation, of emancipation, that we have inherited. Not from the people who formerly were slaves, but from the people who formerly were uh, slave owners, and now tell stories about themselves in the form of Lincoln. Free the, Lincoln didn't free the slaves. You can't free what you incarcerated any more than the state can pardon criminals that it requires in order to function. Okay? Those are the logics that I'm calling zombie humanism that I believe some of Don Haraway's work, far from being the critique of, are in fact participating uh, within. Um, all right, so this is the version of the human that Monty Python always pokes irreverent fun at. This is why, in fact, zombie, uh, this is why Monty Python remains so funny to us. Maybe, maybe just to me. Maybe a few of you still think it's funny. Yeah. Okay. It, it, it's precisely because the version of the human that is being decimated in Monty Python is, in fact, the version of the human that we have inherited, cultivated, and reinvested in with our new narratives of liveliness, of becoming, of rescuing, of altruism, of democracy, and of freedom. All of those things that have become you know, part of the, the bywords of neoliberalism that cover over extraction and exploitation um, are being pilloried in Monty Python in ways that we still actually recognize as true. So to recap and to move to the final section, zombie humanism is a, an understanding of the human that invests in the liveliness of the human by relegating other forms of life to the category of living death. So we are absolutely invested in producing living death or zombie forms of life in order to keep convincing ourselves that we are really here, we really are alive, we really are good, all of those uh, kinds of things. Um, and there's a version of that that depends upon pet loving. And one of the ways in which we tell ourselves that we are not um, in any way harming the animal is we draw a line between beating the animal or having sex in, with the animal and engaging in the practices that we engage in. So I ask you this, you know, could it possibly be more of an invasion to kiss, cuddle, uh, and, and have the pet in your bed than to have sex with the animal? And if you just immediately like, there's just no comparison. Well, why is there no comparison? Animals don't kiss. They don't go under covers, right? Animals don't cuddle up under covers, under do, you know, goose duvets, um, uh, next to human bodies uh, in other circumstances. They only cuddle for warmth. So cuddling, this, human, this idea of the human that's cuddly, right, is part of the transaction by which we convince ourselves that we are good in relationship to our um, possessive investment uh, in the pet. And at the same time, we draw a line between people having intimate relationships with their animals and people fucking them. Just to put it, not to put too fine a point on it. <laughs> So if you read Donna Haraway's companion species, she will, without shame, tell you that she has swapped DNA with her dog, that they enjoyed a sloppy tongue kiss. I don't, I don't see that that's not sex. I don't, okay? A sloppy tongue kiss with an animal is sex as surely as penetration. 
for God's sake, queer studies, lesbian studies has argued that for about 35 years now, that sex is not simply penis in vagina or the equivalent in, uh, in dark terms, right? We have made the argument over and over again for understanding sex as a large, wide array, of suite of practices that involve kissing and stroking and touching and intimacy beyond the penetrative act. Okay? <coughs> so let's take that vision of sex, now apply it to our relations with animals and see that we surely do engage in sexual activity with our animals and we will have to ask ourselves whether it's with or without their consent. Okay? So before, you know, in our evolving discourse around sexual assault, we probably need to think about the visiting of unwanted touching on the animals that we're in relationship to uh, as surely as we are convinced that we are properly legislating human relations of uh, force and consent. So, and the final point of this is that zombie humanism cannot, cannot, under any condition, save a world that it has largely been responsible for endangering in the first place. So if you take away no other little punchline from the talk, it would be that. Um, that you yourself cannot save the thing that you yourself have incarcerated. And yet we live in a world that is absolutely committed to that particular script. Lincoln freed the slaves, uh, the president pardoned the prisoner. Uh, um, most of the people who receive pardons should not be in prison in the first place. That person cannot be pardoned. What we should be doing when we, when we comfort ourselves with narratives of pardoning, right, and narratives of emancipation, what we are reneging on is a much bigger radical narrative about getting rid of the prison system in the first place, okay? So we could extend that to this intimate realm where we become very comfortable with the carceral precisely in relationship to pets, okay? That's the argument uh, of the first half. Uh, so you can prepare your responses, and I'll just close with that little... A nice little plot <laughs> that argues that if you're like, yeah, but a, I mean, in a stuffed animal, that's a harmless relationship. You know, the stuffed animal, we have all kinds of stuff about the transitional object and stuff. The pet is a stuffed animal. Okay, and here's the, here are the examples where the, is the pet, is the stuffed animal modeled on the pet? Or is the pet modeled on the stuffed animal? We know that breeding, a lot of the breeding practices that people engage in, are to make dogs cuter. Oh, the nose was too big. Too big, he needs it to breathe. <laughs> it's not that it's too big. It's a breathing organ, okay? Yeah, we just cut it down. It's better that way. And then the dog dies of pneumonia. I don't know what happened to, you know, peaches or whatever the dog is called, right? So, so we're breeding creatures precisely on the template of the stuffed animal precisely because the pet is not a companion species. It is, in fact, a, a prosthetic that then extends our sense of human goodness far beyond the period of the Enlightenment. All right. So let me just wind down then. Hopefully I provoked you enough with that. Um, or at least, you know, we, have, we might be able to have a fruitful conversation about whether any of this is, is at all accurate. Um, by thinking through then the preoccupation with zombies. Now, I'm somebody who wrote about vampires in relationship to the 19th century. My first book was actually on Gothic horror, um, and I argued in a book on Gothic horror that the vampire was a really important figure at the end of the 19th century because the vampire figured or created a metaphor for concerns and worries that people had partly about Jewish immigrants to London, partly about immigration and foreignness in general. And therefore, it was a symbol of a particular set of racialized fears that had taken hold of London and emerged in this wave, a sweeping wave of vampire stories that Londoners could not get enough of. Uh, it was also about a particular moment in consumer capitalism, a concern that either capitalism is going to consume you or that you're going to be turned into a vampire by your addictive consuming practices, right? So in those terms, I, going back to my own work, would have to say, what is the zombie now? Why, you know, if every era basically produces a monster for its moment, why have we selected the zombie? And I think I've given you one a set of answers to that question in terms of our real ambivalence about the project of the human, our uncertainty about the status of liveliness, our 
acquiescence to the production of a, an entire group of people called the living dead in order for us, uh, some of us, um, some privileged few, to feel that they have a more dynamic relationship to life. But what else? What about the history of this figure? And why and when has it emerged as a paradigmatic symbol of a set of fears, concerns, interests, and investments of any different, any given era? Okay. So I have a quote for this section that takes us into Michel Foucault's work on the biopolitical, in which he reminds us that the state is not a cold monster. It is the correlative of a particular way of governing. In other words, the state isn't out there doing things to you. The state is in here. It is a <coughs> mode that we have internalized and that we legislate every day in relationship to one another through various kinds of channels that include race, sexuality, gender, uh, ableism, um, and so on, all of those kinds of categories of difference that we've been able to catalog, recognize, and then even um, dispense with in some, in some cases. So the state is in here. So when we're, when we're talking about zombie humanism, we're also talking about a way of governing that takes hold of you at the level of the intimate, in, in your interiority, and is being transacted, therefore, by you through popular culture, through your reactions with other people, and through your basic relationship between life and death. Now, anyone could, could see from watching anything in pop culture right now on zombies that the zombie is a racialized figure. Okay? And I'm going to go over some of the ways in which the zombie is racialized, but the, um, is a racializing force. <laughs> but the first thing to know, of course, is that the term zombie was pulled into American popular culture from Haiti. And Haiti, we should remember, is the birthplace of a certain kind of modernity since it was the place of the first slave rebellion uh, and is a place where zombie named a particular fear in Haiti in the 19th century that people having, sh having shaken off the yoke of slavery would die and come back to life again as a slave. Okay? So zombie was originally a critique of slavery. It was the fear. What if I die and I come back and I am not in control of my own body? My body is being manipulated by another. That was the fear that zombieism uh, named. But in American popular culture, it was instead turned into a fear of black zombies who were workers who lacked the human capacity to think for themselves and therefore were easily manipulated by white plantation owners who use them for nefarious purposes. And so you have these uh, various films like White Zombie, right, where a, a white woman, of course it's the specter of a white woman who's being engulfed by black men, a white woman who another white man wants to marry, but she's married to someone else. So he contacts this Bela Lugosi uh, figure who turns the woman into a zombie. He will do whatever he commands. He commands the woman to leave her husband and um, take up with the, the new guy. It doesn't end well. Um, um, but you know, it could have been a place where you see these, these black male figures uh, milling around and you, you think that they are going to rise up against um, the, the uh, owners of the land. But of course, they just become the symbol of the threat of not being able to you know, uh, have access to consciousness and speak for yourself and think for yourself and so on. So it's a profoundly colonial trope by the time it enters into uh, American popular culture. And you do get, you know, it's constantly sort of thematizing uh, revolt, the revolt of the zombies. Clearly, in the era right before decolonization, the zombie is a fear that the colonized other is going to take freedom f and use it for revolution. You know, if, if, if only it was that easy. Um, and so you get a lot of these films in which newly uh, decolonized peoples rise up against um, uh, white people. So that's sort of how in the 30s the figure of the zombie, en the zombie enters into popular culture. In terms of our uh, interests, the most important landmark film in zombie culture, of course, is George Romero's 1968 classic, Night of the Living Dead. How many people have seen Night of the Living Dead? A few, OK. Night of the Living Dead is an amazing film, in fact, about, not about um, up uprising, although uprising is very much uh, uh, a thematic within it, but about white racism. 
Um, and I just want to give you a little sense of it, and then I'll conclude with our, um, a few of our current uh, um, programs about zombies. So historically, Night of the Living Dead is super important. 1968, right, this is a signal year um, for um, civil rights movement, for black protests against white supremacy. It, it features a historic casting of a black man, Dwayne Jones, in the lead role. This is the first time a black man has been given a lead role in a Hollywood film, ever, <laughs> 1968, in a zombie film. And he plays the rational, calm figure in a farmhouse that many people have taken refuge in when suddenly some weird galactic event has created a zombie episode on Earth. And the zombies start advancing across the Pennsylvania countryside, and white people take refuge in a house. And at one moment, Dwayne uh, Jones plays a black man who enters into the house. Now, um, at, at, at that point, you're wondering whether the white people are actually going to allow the black man to come in. Uh, and at that point, he is already cast as part of the zombie populations uh, that are roaming around outside, rather than part of the humans who uh, must be saved. The film was protested by white audiences because it features a scene in which Dwayne Jones tries to subdue a hysterical white woman who's screaming and he slaps her across the face and knocks her across the room. And white audiences protested this. Never mind the fact that later on he blows the brains out of the really obnoxious white guy. You know, and at which point you're sort of like, yes, get rid of that guy. But audience protested this vision of black on white uh, violence that the film is able surreptitiously to sneak in. However, the really, um, and there's, uh, Dwayne Jones with the white woman that he slaps across the room and with the gun, uh, which is obviously an image that in 1968 is going to be read against Malcolm X and the Black Panthers. Here you have a black man uh, with, a, with a gun. But um, the really um, uh, you know, telling scene is the final scene, <laughs> spoiler alert, when Dwayne Jones is the only one who survives in the farmhouse. And finally, the, the dawn comes up, and he looks out, and he sees the police are coming. This is like resonates for Black Lives Matters today. He sees the police are coming and he's like, oh my God, I'm saved. This is amazing. And he goes outside and he's like, hello, hello. And they shoot him. And that's the last scene of the film. There's no commentary. The, the, the moralism is clear. There's, the police never realized that they, the, they were shooting zombies across the country. They never realized the mistake. And that's the legacy that the film offers you is that the police cannot tell the difference between a marauding horde of zombies and a black man, right? And that, the fact of that indistinguishability is a massive optic on white supremacy, on a particular way of seeing that cannot, cannot separate out <coughs> the monstrous from the human, and in fact, simply piles blackness into the category of the, of the uh, monstrous uh, wholesale. Okay. Uh, there are many other ways in which um, the zombie has been racialized, including in relationship to indigenous people who are seen as zombified by uh, a sort of genocidal logic that understands them as evolutionarily situated pre-whiteness. Uh, and therefore, you don't have to say that you know Americans wiped out Native Americans. They disappeared in this sort of evolutionary move that <coughs> calls zombie imperialism, the production of Native people as a zombie force, who were not wiped out, simply uh, disappeared. All right. So let's just close then. I, I offer you two examples that absolutely you know, capitalize on what I just said about the zombie being racialized as black on the one hand, um, in relationship to a zombie humanism that is putatively white and is native on the other, in relationship to a zombie imperialism that sees native peoples as people who no longer exist because they never entered modernity. I think that this image from The Walking Dead shows you, gives you a visual for the way in which the white at the beginning of the series, remember season one, it was all white people, and the white people were basically going around massacring everything that seemed to move without the proper life force. Um, and Rick the, is basically, this is like a wild western narrative, and he's the sheriff, he's literally the sheriff. He has a sheriff's badge. 
He wears, he wears a, a um, holster with a gun in it. He is literally the white cowboy come to clean up the zombification of the US, which is represented here using a lot of the iconography of indigenous peoples who restlessly move around, right? They're nomadic, they don't settle, they don't take up residence anywhere, except in season two, we find that uh, one place where some humans, and this makes very clear the racial politics of the walking dead, uh, some uh, place where the walking dead can't penetrate is a prison. Okay, so this is sort of inversion of the relationship between uh, the, the prison as a site of incarceration and the world as a site of freedom. The prison, the little band of survivors are like, oh my god, a prison. We should go in the prison and fortify ourselves against the zombies. So in they go, and guess who they find there? A group of black men, because who's in prison? And the black men don't know about the zombie apocalypse, and they're like, what's, you know, what's going on? So what happens to our little band of walking dead survivors? They're like, oh my god, criminals. Criminals? It's zombie apocalypse, people. <laughs> right? And you're like, gosh, what do you think they did? Why are they in jail? Are we safe here? Are we safe? Right? Think all the way back to when I was talking about recklessness. This discourse of safety and security is a radically conservative uh, discourse of r racial predation. Are we safe here? They decide they are not, and one by one, they kill every single person that they found in that prison because in the end it's a moral universe and only the good can uh, survive in the little band that uh, Rick leads. So that's the American version, but I want to close with uh, the British. Well, there's the, the comic book is way more interesting as it always is. The graphic uh, novel is, is way more um, interesting. Um, but there's the, the divide between the, the zombie human and the, the zombie living dead uh, with the fence between them um, because we, the viewer, have to be schooled in who deserves to live and who deserves to die. That is the point. Season after season, season after season, bad person must die. Bad person was only thinking about themselves, kill them. Uh, bad person, lesbian, kill them, right? So you can look at the logic of who dies and who lives. Why does Rick never die? I mean, that dude, he killed his best friend in season two. I don't see how Rick is, anyway. Um, <laughs> in the British context, there's a really different zombie film. Has anyone seen In the Flesh? Yay, okay, the beauty of people who actually watch TV. I mean, what happened to watching TV, people? I know it's back, but um, in this British show, In the Flesh, you get a much more pointed critique of neoliberalism. It's a completely different narrative. In this narrative, in 2009, there was an event, an ecological event, in which everyone who died that year came back from the dead. And the, a massacre occurs, then the zombies are subdued, and then the question is, everything returns sort of to order, but you still have the zombies. The zombies don't go back, go back to being humans. So the question for the state is, what do we do with the zombies? And there's a group of racists who are like, kill them, incarcerate them, kick them out, they need to go, we've got to get rid of them, they threaten us. And then there's another <coughs> sort of humanist group that say we should rehabilitate them. I'm going to give you a little clip of the, uh, the, the preview for the show, give you a sense of it. And the, the main is a bit different looking book. He's still he suicide. Died, committed suicide and has come back as a zombie. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. We're living in a world where real monsters exist. They're not your neighbors, not your friends. They are imposters, changelings, and the highest law of this. I don't feel ready. That's why they say I am ready. Because I'm feeling. For the undead, life begins again. In the, in the flesh. So, um, so how do you re rehabilitate a zombie? You put makeup on him, you put him in a therapy group, group therapy, and you give him injections in the back of the neck. And here's the, the neoliberal solution to the zombie. Reincorporate, okay? Reincorporate as if the human is so great that those people who stop being human must be reincorporated. But the amazing thing about that show 
is it revolves around a young guy, a gay guy who killed himself and is brought back from the dead. And his, his mom is like, oh my God, it's so great to have you back. A second, you have a second chance. He's like, I don't want a second chance. This is the world, this is still the world that I said no to when I kill myself and I don't want to be in it. So it is, the zombie stages a refusal of the world as it exists and refuses to be saved by the people who have constructed this uh, system of zombie humanism that makes a distinction between the living and the dead. So here's my um, conclusion then. And this is under the heading of No Future, which I had somewhere. Okay, so who are zombies? Zombies are the millions of bodies that exist between life and death in this era that we live in of end stage development. The question is not life or death, but lives and death and everything in between. The living, walking, subturating dead are those bodies that we have assigned to the gray zone between the good life and the bad life. They include the incarcerated, refugees, the hungry, the terminally ill, the very young, the sick and dying, the old, the homeless, the drug addicts, endangered species, the mentally ill, the disabled, the starving, the dispossessed, the occupied, the unsaved, unremembered, irredeemable, illegible, illegitimate, undead. The undead are hungry. They are angry, they are sick, and they are tired. And while you may look upon them with horror today, tomorrow we will all, no doubt, try to save them in order to redeem a seriously compromised sense of our own humanity. But in the end, it is not we who can save the zombie. It's the zombie who will decide whether we live or die and whether survival <coughs> will be worth it. You know, it's like when, when I was writing about failure, I wasn't just saying, okay, failure, not success. I'm, I'm, I think what I'm trying to do is get at the logic of order versus yes. disorder, within which we see order as good and disorder as bad. Right. It's actually context-specific, isn't it? Yes. Because there are lots of situations within which disorder is not 
desirable and in fact is harmful to um, uh, you, you know massive numbers of people and a lot of you know some people say uh, one of the attacks on anarchy is like well that's just chaos and we just have chaos if we don't have the state we'll just have chaos but the answer from some anarchists is that capitalism is chaotic yes. but the chaos, chaos is experienced at the lower end of the economic scale you know rich people can afford order uh, I will get up, at, I, I will, my driver will pick me up at this time, I will go here, there will be a jet waiting, you know. But at the lower end of an economic scale, capitalism sows disorder precisely through a politics of scarcity and the refusal to redistribute wealth. So I think that's what I'm getting at. Or think about when, you know, I went to a traffic court recently because when I was in LA, I was arrested, I wasn't arrested, I was given a ticket for um, um, jaywalking. And I said to the policeman, I'm like, you're lucky I'm walking. This is LA. You should be rewarding me for walking, not giving me a damn ticket for crossing the street. And he's like, here's your ticket, you know, like get out of my face. So I went to court with it. I was like, no, you are not giving me a ticket for ticket. That's irrelevant. What was really, you know, for people like me, for people like me, the eye opener is to go to court for small infractions and see how poor people are being nickeled and dimed out of existence. So there was an activist uh, judge in the courtroom that day and it was one person after the other came up and the guy would say, um, well I was pulled over for having my backlight had been smashed on the street and I hadn't fixed it. And then he said, and the judge like, yeah but you had a fix it ticket and you didn't fix it. And he's like, well right because I can't drive the car with the light out and therefore I can't make the money to fix the light. And the one day I took it, the car out because I had to get groceries and picked up by the police for the infraction, and here I am, and now I can't pay at all the fine that you're imposing upon me. It was like that. One case after, or the woman who's like, I got pulled over and I didn't have registration. And the judge is like, but why did you get pulled over? She's like, oh, I don't know about that, but I didn't have proper registration. The guy, they can't pull you over. You can't just be pulled over, and then he tries to figure out what you've done wrong. He had to have a reason to pull you over, right? That's the, the deployment of chaos and order is what we're after. Here. Well, you broke the rules. The rules mean you must pay. Why are poor people paying, you know, these, this nickel being nickel and dimed with administrative fines and fees and costs, right, when, poor, when rich people don't even pay their taxes? This is this, this problem of scale that capitalism uses to invest in these logics of order and disorder that we want to disrupt. And I guess you could define chaos, right? So for me, a prison with more freedom for inmates would make sense to be more humane, but to the people who run the prisons, they think chaos is the least little bit of like activity that's not controlled by them and movement that's uh -huh. not controlled by them. Right. So, I mean, that, that's another thing I think. Yeah. All of us have sort of different definitions. But that is exactly why the prison population, you know, as you see in this image, looks like a zombie population because they are asked to move only at a certain speed, only at a certain time, only through certain corridors. You know, th that notion that I'm just going to go down the hall is out of your poss realm of possibility. And so, then they say move to. Right, but to notice that even in that, within that understanding of the, the scene of the prison, Ungovernability is when there is movement and when there is disorder. What the prison guard knows is that without order, the population will be ungovernable. But that's what we're after. To a certain extent, we want to understand ungovernability, not how we can make things more ruly, but how we can make them more unruly. Rather than sort of the epitome of, of, of empire in a way, right? 
Right, but I think that Enlightenment humanism transacts through different, um, uh, di different invests in different concepts of the human. So it's the, uh, uh, yes, the interest in pos possession, uh, the interest in the freedom of movement, for example, in, in, in Locke and others, the, the right to own property, but also the idea that um, enlightenment, man, enlightenment man is somehow good. And that, that goodness, there's a lot of uh, ink, you know, spilled on defining where, w what is the good, is it related to the beautiful, uh, what does it have to do with um, uh, relationships to the other and to the neighbor and, and, and so on. And this seems to be a different kind of humanism, a humanism within which a very explicit racial logic is central and one in which the division between life and death uh, is paramount. And I'm not sure that that was the division in Enlightenment discourse. You know, in, in fact, in the disorder of things, um, Foucault, uh, in the disorder of things, that's what I call it, in the order of things, <laughs> Foucault makes a distinction between um, um, two different periods of modernity, one in which there's a presence of a god who, who uh, you know, rules benevolently, and the next within which the organizing principle is death. Uh, and he wants to know what difference it makes when we start to live life in relationship to the finitude, um, in relationship to finitude, in relationship to um, a horizon, uh, and in relationship to life as something that has to have meaning separate from religion. So I think we're in another moment of that, um, that kind of uh, post-enlightenment discourse. It may can't possibly be the same, and I know I'm not doing a great job right here of historicizing it, but even the historicity within which we begin to think about <clears throat> longevity as a universal good, much to be desire, desired, despite the fact that longevity adds the years to your life at the end of your life, right? Oh, you live 15 years longer. Do you get your 15 years when you're 35? No, you get them when you're 75. I don't want them then. Right? The unquestioned good of longevity requires some, some kind of analysis. You, you want to jump in Go again? No, no. Oh, yeah. No, hold on. I just uh, I felt, feel like you're, you wanted to say something more. The, oh, Chris, yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Right. The defining of the category of human in relation to vast portions of the world can be defined as non human. And I'm just I'm wondering what that might imply for a non I mean, and you're, and you're particularly girl on those groups, um, the, 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 and, and the foreground and empire right. in your readings of them. So I was just trying to think through. But it may not be a break. It, it's not necessarily so different from Enlightenment humanism. It's just that it has different um, uh, trigger points. It has different intensities, different places where it pulls and takes on um, value, or or has a kind of transactive uh, um, meaning where people where there's a purchase to it. I mean, if I were to say, well, the definition of, of the human is you know sweetness and light, or 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 doing good in the world. I mean, we're like not. Really, I mean that can't possibly be the definition of the human. Almost no one cleaves to such an idea. Or um, e we even we even are questioning the relationship to property. Um, and, and now we understand that property is just part of a, a, a spiraling out of control version of venture capital. That the property you own is not at all a thing anymore. It's not exactly your house. It's the equity, right? You don't own you don't own a house. Almost none of us actually own a house. If you, if you decide to buy, you exist in relationship to the speculation that the house is invested in. Given that, given this new phase of capitalism that is speculative, surely there's a different understanding of the human. Can some, some of the features of that new human be discerned through the rubric of the zombie? It's, just, it's a question, it's not really an answer. Yeah. I think we might just take one more question and then have a more informal Conversation. Okay, so there was one question, and then were you going to ask a question, Julie? I'm going to ask a lot of questions, but it doesn't have to be right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so yeah, thank you so much. This was really exciting for me, and I'm just crashing into another college, too, so 
Uh oh. That's especially great. <laughs> right. But um, I I really like am obsessed with this idea of dogs and horror movies. I've been doing a lot of research for it um, mm. through this journal called Blind Field, but it's not it's in Santa Cruz, but not associated with Donna Haraway. And right. I, what I think of is that how dogs can act as a semiotic switchboard for what we can conceive of the human self after the Anthropocene ends. Like if you're thinking of it as like this like deadline where like humans are no longer on Earth, and a lot of this has to do with like witnessing dogs in movies like like say like I Am Legend. There's that dog. It's a really big deal. Will Smith has this like lovely dog that runs on a treadmill with him. They're best friends, and it's like this yeah. proxy child, right? Right. It's, like, projection of self onto the dog. But if you look at like the original novel, which is like the first like Western zombie novel, ah. um, it's from 1920, there's no dog in the book. It's like all about like the biggest anxiety in the novel is like there's no women to have sex with. And like <laughs> the way I saw it is like if you're taking this like thing from the 1920s and reproducing it in like, you know, like 2009 or so, you're actually like, I don't think it has as much to do with like the late stages of capital but as having to do with like this crisis of the environment and mm -hmm. how like we cannot see our earth as being an earth for much longer, but rather turning into like what we don't gene factor and turns it into is like the planet. Like yeah. we're thinking about this, like we're conceiving our world as a planet and yeah. if we cannot go on and our proxy children can't go on, then like there's also this fallback that dogs are like failed workers. So if you watch maybe like signs or like Baba Dude, like they can't protect the kids and yeah. like Banan, Mordiga and like all these other um, it knows that even like refer to dogs as like being like lazy workers. Wow. So you can't construe it either as like this like proxy child that we put our hopes into, like Chewbacca too, like the whole planet died in the like, Star Wars. And yeah. no one's faced by that, but I swear <laughs> if Chewbacca had died, people would have right. been so upset. Like, <laughs> like even for this, um, there's this video game called Fallout 4 and it's an apocalypse game and like they the newest addition is that they added this dog to it and People were so upset at this conference, they were like, please tell us that this dog cannot die. And that was the most, that was the number one question about this like billion dollar game. Like, will this dog be able to die? Because people were like, we won't play it if the dog can die. Like, that will break our hearts. And this, there's this whole website, like, does the dog die? In the end? And it's just like, you can like, you can see that people like can't, like they don't, they can't like empathize with bodies that their ontologies are separate from their own. So like what they can do is bestow like this kind of like Cartesian notion of self into a dog and project it into a future that's terrestrial but not this earth. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and so like my question is like, <laughs> sorry. You don't need to ask questions. I just want to read your book. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm like, first of all, obviously I'm not a pet person. You probably got that. <laughs> so it, it also isn't really a, a, an argument for letting the animal be its full animal self yeah. either. It's more a question about what is our investment in pet economies right now. Um, I was just talking beforehand about Heidi Nast's work. Heidi Nast is a demographer from Chicago who has something that she wants to develop called critical pet studies in which... She, she feels exactly as you, like in a film, if an animal dies, this is the no-no. This is the absolutely signal event, and we have to have entire 
uh, provisos at the end of films saying that no animals were harmed in the making of this film, but we don't know about whether other kinds of people were harmed or whether the janitorial staff was paid properly, you know. Uh, but you do have to know whether the budgie was, was really dead, right, in the Monty Python skit and, and so on. So it isn't about the, the full, the, the, that the animal has been denied access to the fullness of its experience. It's that we're developing into a society within which we're changing our relationship to space, intimacy, reproduction, um, um, longevity, life, death, and so on. And there are symbols for some of those shifts, just places like literally canaries in the coal mine. There are a few little places that you can read what some of those changes are. So what Heidi Nass says, for example, is after doing a demographic study of parks in Chicago, she correlates the declining reproductive rate among white middle class families to the increase in dog runs in the city. So white people not having children, not, don't need the park, create the dog run, okay? Uh, I thought, I was like, wow, that's a great argument. I don't believe it. Until in my neighborhood when I was in LA, the little park that kids could walk down to on their own suddenly was a dog run. And I'm like, oh my God, here it is, the dog run. Now, this all at the same time that LA has a massive homeless problem and homeless people are not welcome in the park. But we've set aside a massive amount of public space for bourgeois white people and others to take their dogs and have a, a rich social life uh, in the realm of the dog run. So someone should do a, a dissertation on the dog run, the politics of the dog run, against the politics of homelessness, against the public park, the commons, uh, the notion of shared space, and so on. Um, and it's against those kinds of developments that we want to keep shifting and changing, altering, maybe only incrementally, what we mean by the human. Um, so I've, your project about looking at dogs in films is just absolutely right on, and I want to know your name afterwards and find out if you've published anything and see what happens to it. So thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Space for about half an hour longer if you want to stay and please eat as much food as you possibly can and talk to Jack. Thank you for coming.